Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World, where the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. And also we have a free MSC company database categorized by industry sector, location, as well as internship and full-time titles. So if you're interested in that, you can find the link in the description below. Hello, hello. Welcome back everyone to the show. I'm Puneet and I got my co-host David here. So I'm asking a pretty relevant question to the topic we'll get into, but David, do you think you would ever join a startup as one of the first team members, like one of the first three to join a startup? Yeah. So I do have some experience. I did do an internship when I was like number 18 or 20, I think. So on the very small scale. And so, yeah, so I, I've seen what it's like when it's at the very beginning. And so already that was like, they were like at least stable for a couple of years. So I guess if I zoom back out to like three members, like one of the first couple, I'm not sure at this point in time uh, <laughs> that I am smart enough because when you do start a company that small, you have to like know everything because there's really nobody else to go to. I mean, of course you would probably have mentors or you have other contacts in the industry, but these problems that you're solving are those of your own. And so right now I'm not quite sure if I'm confident enough, but I think that give enough time that anybody can learn enough to become the experts. And that's why like after 20 years, like you become an expert in your field. And so maybe in 20 years I would, but <laughs> currently I don't think so. What about you? Yeah. And also just like on top of that, it is like a financial risk, right? Where it's like that company could go any which direction. It could be huge, but it could also kind of like sputter after a few years. So I think I know this isn't really like the science-based reason, but like I would, if I, if I were to join a startup at a very early stage, I would hope that I have some other, like, you know, I have that financial cushion um, mm -hmm. or like other income sources to be able to kind of afford to take that risk. And I guess, so the reason we're asking this question is because our guest today, Dr. Nikki Cates was the second member to join Smart Material Solutions. She has very impressive background, which we'll get into in the episode. But that was one of the, the first things that I was just very shocked about is just like her willingness to kind of take that leap because that wasn't in her initial plan at all. But she was just so passionate about this nano coining process that she kind of put everything else at the, at the wayside and, and jumped in. So David, what do you think listeners should look forward to in this episode or what was your favorite part about it? Yeah, I think that just learning about nano coining and the actual process behind it is fascinating. And I think she does a very good job of breaking down this very technically intense process and just yeah. something that I was able to understand. And then of course, the applications were very cool as well. What are you looking forward to? Yeah, I thought it was super cool just how she talked about nano coining in the realm of metamaterials so again these are just concepts that almost go like way over my head like metamaterials we've had a whole episode on it and still it's just like this very complex concept but just the potential to turn science fiction into reality and to be able to like nano coining potentially offers that solution of scaling these r d nanoscale innovations to like consumer products, large scale products in, in space, in solar panels, et cetera. So it's just super fascinating to, to learn about. And I, I think you all will really have, it'll be a, a lot technically, but it's, it's something that um, if you're able to understand it and ask questions and, and get curious about it, it's, it has a lot of potential to make an impact in the world. So with all that being said, Let's get right into the episode. Hey everyone, we are excited to welcome today's guest, Dr. Nicole Cates, Senior Research Scientist at Smart Material Solutions. Nikki graduated at the top of her class at Carnegie Mellon University with a BS and an MS in Material Science and Engineering. She would then be awarded an NSF fellowship for her PhD on organic solar cells at Stanford University. She also completed a postdoctoral position at Bosch and internships at Ford, NASA, and Bose. 
Later, Nikki received the prestigious Marie Curie Fellowship to perform research at the Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona, Spain, where she and her colleagues patented a world record solar cell technology and published the results in Nature Phototonics. Now at Smart Material Solutions, Nikki leads the company's nanofabrication and nano characterization efforts. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nikki. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to join. You know, I've been part, I've, I've actually been listening to your podcast for a little bit now. So it was pretty exciting to get an invitation from you guys. <laughs> yeah, that made my day when I remember just emailing uh, the company and and Nikki responded saying like, oh yeah, I've heard, I've heard about your podcast. I've listened to a few episodes. So that was definitely like cool to, to see that, you know, we've kind of expanded and, and, and grown um, since we first started. <laughs> but yeah, you're your background is very, very impressive, very extensive. So I'm excited to dive into this. But before we go into that, can you maybe talk about like how this company, Smart Material Solutions, was founded? From my understanding, it began because uh, the founder, Stephen, was training for the Olympic trials. And now like you're currently at this team of three or four, depending on the intern, growing this company to, to new heights. So can you elaborate on that founding story for us? Yeah, of course. Um, and I'm glad you asked, because I do think it's a pretty unique founding story. So as you mentioned, our CEO, Stephen First, founded the company, but he founded it in a very different form than it is now. So he founded it as his personal engineering consulting company. And the reason he did that is he is an extremely strong runner. And at the time he had qualified for the Olympic trials in both the 5k and the marathon. So he was training for both of those events. And as you can imagine, training for those type of events at the Olympic level requires a huge amount of time and dedication. And that type of time commitment just isn't compatible with a nine to five job. So he looked to consulting as a way to get the flexibility to both work and train at the same time. So he started consulting and he did a good deal of consulting at the Precision Engineering Center, which is a part of NC State. And while he was there, he worked on a ton of cool projects, but none of them were nanocoining, which is our core technology. However, while he was there, um, there was a PhD student who was starting to work on nanopointing as a part of his PhD project. And Stephen saw the technology, saw its promise, thought it was really cool. But unfortunately, like many PhD projects, he saw that it was probably going to be shelved when the student graduated and left. And um, seeing the promise of the technology, Stephen thought, gosh, we could really do something with this. So he wrote a grant to the NSF and the National Science Foundation. That grant he did get, and it allowed him to begin further developing the technology and hopefully commercialize it. That's when I joined the company. So then Stephen and I partnered up. We used that grant money to spin the company out of NC State and start actually developing the technology for commercialization. And through the years, we've had several engineers that have worked closely with us. Uh, we've also had interns most summers. And thankfully, about three years ago, one of our interns introduced us to Lauren Micklow, who is a fantastic mechanical engineer. And she joined our team. And since then, we've been like a core technical team of three people, uh, Stephen, myself, and Lauren. And we're you know, probably, I guess we're not officially hiring, but we're always on the lookout for new talent. And, um, you know, if we find the right fit, we're definitely open to hiring another person in the foreseeable future. So, yeah, so that sounds like a very small group. And so one question that we had was that you were at Stanford and you had, you probably had other opportunities at either universities or national labs, et cetera. What drew you to come back to the Raleigh area and join this company? Oh, well, I guess if you would have told me 10 years ago that I was going to be working at a startup company in Raleigh, I just would not have believed you. <laughs> but when I finished my postdoc in Spain, I decided, oh, it's going to be better, easier to find a new position when I'm actually in the States. So I moved back to Raleigh, which is where my family lives. And I started looking for positions, but I was applying to positions in the Northeast 
And I was applying mainly to two types of positions, neither of which was startup company. Um, <laughs> so one was research, but I've always been more attracted to industrial research than academic research. Um, I've done my fair share of fundamental academic research. I think it's great that people are out there doing it, but I personally like to be a little closer to the product, be able to point to something and say, hey, I was a part of making that a little bit better. So I like to be closer to the product and therefore I like to be more in industry. So I was applying to industrial positions, but those were positions at very big companies, um, not startups. Separately, I was applying to teaching positions at universities, but those are like lecturer positions or teaching professorships. I wasn't interested in being a full professor and doing academic research and trying to juggle that with teaching. So I was applying to both of those categories and um, I had a couple offers in both of those categories. And then I met Steven and he told me about nanopointing and I thought, gosh, this is such a cool technology. I have to be a part of it. And all my plans changed. Um, and I ended up back you know, where I started in Raleigh, North Carolina, working at a startup company that I didn't even know existed, you know, six wow. months prior. <laughs> That's crazy. That's like such a big pivot from like the two paths you were, you were eyeing. Um, yeah. But that's crazy. And so like, I know we're kind of just like talking about nano coining, but let's finally get into it, right? So Smart Material Solutions is developing this nano coining process. Um, it involves nano patterning that enables scalable nano manufacturing, nano fabrication through the creation of seamless cylindrical molds, if I'm not mistaken. So can you just explain what this technology is and how it works? So at a very high level, like you said, nano coining is a process to nano pattern large areas quickly. The reason we're excited about that is there's a ton of really cool technologies out there that have been proven in the lab scale that rely on nano patterning, but have no way to like leave the lab scale and be manufactured at the industrial scale. And we feel like nano coining can kind of fill that gap and bring those technologies that are stuck in the lab to industry. So the way nano coining actually works is based on coining and that's where it gets its name. Coining is the process that the mint uses to create coins. So you start with a die that has some type of pattern engraved in it you press that die into a metal blank, the pattern transfers from the die to the metal and you end up with a coin. So we're essentially doing the same thing, but on the nano scale, we start with a nano patterned diamond die. We press that nano pattern diamond into metal and we create a copy of the nano pattern diamond in the metal. So that's already pretty cool, but the key to nano coinings very high speed is that we can use an ultrasonic actuator that's vibrating at about 50 kilohertz. And what that means is that 50,000 times every single second, we're taking our nano pattern diamond and denting it into metal and creating a copy of the nano pattern in the metal. So even though it might've taken me a full hour to nano pattern my diamond, I'm making 50,000 copies of that nano pattern every second. So it rapidly scales up the process and even that's cool, but it's not the coolest part of nano coining, I think. The coolest part is that we use a, a high precision lathe to do this process. And by using this high precision lathe, we can tile the nano patterns side by side. And by perfectly stitching the nano pattern indents all the way around a cylinder, we can create a cylinder that has a nano pattern on it all the way around with no seams. And that can be used in roll-to-roll -roll processes to print out what, what could be miles of a polymer film with nano patterns on it. So obviously it's a pretty exciting technology and it basically slowly scales up nano patterning from a slow process in diamond. We then copy that into uh, metal very quickly with a, a vibrating actuator. And then we can use the indented metal to imprint very large areas of polymer films. That process is fantastic. So let's break that down a little bit more. So starting with the diamonds. So from what we know about diamonds, diamonds is probably a good pick because it's so hard, but to make a nano pattern on a diamond, could you kind of walk us through that and explain maybe some complexities or drawbacks of that process? 
Yes, of course. So there's a lot of different ways to nano pattern diamond. When we do it, we're using traditional techniques. So that could be um, like photolithography or something like that. We tend to use a focused ion beam or fib. When we do our patterning with a fib, we're essentially shining an ion beam at our sample. And by doing that, sputtering away carbon atoms and we're left with a nano pattern diamond. So if we can control the path and position of our, our ion beam, we can control the pattern that's created in the diamond. And of course you, you alluded to there's challenges and, and that starts to get into some very technical area, but you know, there's definitely challenges. Someone, you know, may come to me and ask for a very complicated structure. And, you know, sometimes I have to sit down and think about how am I actually going to make this pattern? Um, before I can just go and do it. So how does it compare to maybe some other traditional examples of, I guess, like nanofabrication um, or some other methods that maybe like our listeners and us um, are more familiar with? Can you maybe talk through the comparison and the contrast there and maybe some of the advantages versus disadvantages? Right. Well, I guess one of the advantages of focused ion beam of the diamond is that I can create a 3D structure, whereas most photolithography you create, you know, a binary structure. It's either, you know, sharp edges, it's on or off. With FIB, I can create these nice 3D structures. And then those nice 3D structures we can use in nanopointing to create, you know, say a lens with a particular design shape. One of the big advantages of both FIB and nanopointing is the ability to have these seamless, or not, excuse me, <laughs> the ability to have these uh, 3D surface shapes. Another advantage of both FIB and nanocoining is that we don't use like resist development and etching and those type of processes that would be pretty traditional for photolithography, e-beam, any of those type of processes. And then of course, uh, a big advantage of nanocoining, not a FIB, is it's high speed. So FIB is a very low speed process. We just do it once on our diamond, but nanocoining is a very high speed process. So we can cover large areas that really wouldn't be feasible with things like photolithography, electron beam lithography, and things like that. And then, yeah, the, so once we have the diamond with our certain pattern embedded, you're saying that we're moving at 50 kilohertz. And so I guess my question is, we can move a ultrasonic uh, actuator that fast, but is the material itself moving or are you moving the actuator head? Or once I have the diamond, how do I imprint it on like a five foot by five foot surface or what, what is that process like? Right. So as I had mentioned earlier, it's on a, a lathe. So a lathe is spinning our parts. And then at the same time, we have this ultrasonic actuator. The ultrasonic actuator is physically moving the diamond in an elliptical path. So the diamond is moving in and out on up in an ellipse. When it gets close to the rotating metal part, it indents the ellipse. When it gets to the rotating metal part, it indents into the metal. And that indenting process is what transfers the pattern from the diamond into the metal. It's a continuous process though, as I said, it's done on a lathe. So you're continuously causing the diamond to go along this elliptical path. At the same time, you are rotating your cylinder and you're essentially creating a spiral of indents all the way around your cylinder. Great. Uh, thank you for explaining it. I, I feel like you took a very foreign concept and broke it down for us. And so now that we understand like the very basics of nanocoining, um, now we can talk about the actual applications. And so in a previous episode about space systems, we discussed how NASA is very interested in reducing dust adhesion. What about nanocoining makes it ideal for creating dust mitigating surfaces? Right. Yeah. I'm glad you guys recently had a episode on dust adhesion because, you know, it's a huge problem for NASA, which I didn't appreciate until fairly recently. I recently learned that for the Apollo missions, dust adhesion to like the astronaut suits and equipment and stuff was so bad that when they got off the moon's surface and got away from its gravity, the dust created haze in the cabin. So 
clearly it's a, it's a huge issue. And with NASA looking to return to the moon in the next couple of years, they're trying to attack this from all angles and they're sponsoring a ton of research in this area. And I think that the true solution will be a combination of things, but hopefully we're a part of that. So our approach is to add a nano pattern to a surface. And that's because when a dust particle lands on a surface, it turns out a lot of the adhesion force between the particle and the surface is just due to the contact area between the particle and the surface. So if you can add a nano pattern, you essentially have, let's say, little nano spikes on your surface. Now the dust particle is sitting on top of those nano features. And so you've significantly decreased the contact area between the dust particle and the surface. Because of that, you've also significantly decreased the adhesion force of the dust particle to the surface. So this isn't a new concept. This is a concept that has been known for decades, but really where we fit in with nanocoining as for the first time being able to cover large areas with these nano features so that you can create large area dust mitigating surfaces. So we've been working with a group at UT Austin to do this. And so far we've made some prototypes where we show that we can have about a 90% reduction in dust adhesion only by adding a nano pattern. So if we compare a nano pattern surface to the exact same material with no nano pattern, 93% reduction in the dust that's adhered. So that's, it's pretty awesome. That's but crazy. now we have new chow. Yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned so, you had a, a new challenge. Yeah, so our new challenge is to start to apply that to different materials and actually put it on products or applications that might end up in space. Got it. So on that prototype, like just to put it in perspective, how big was that prototype and how long did it take to create that? Right. So the prototype that we made was just, I think it was like two square inches or something. It was pretty small and it didn't take particularly long to make, but we were making lots of different patterns to see what worked better and what didn't work so well. So a big part of the next process is actually working with a company called Microcontinuum, and we're doing all of this in roll to roll. And when we do that, we're going to be making several square meters at least of material to demonstrate that this can be done on truly large areas. And so one, one question I have is that, so if we're making these pointed surfaces to basically reduce the surface area, uh, we're making these nano features, and if we go to space, it's going to go into a lot of stresses, a lot of forces, etc. Does nano coining greatly affect the physical property of the material, uh, like the metal, so make it more brittle, more ductile? Or have we, have you guys looked into that area of once you nano coin, how does it affect the properties other than just dust adhesion? Right. Yeah, there's, there's a huge push to understand that basically anytime you nano pattern a surface, there's a chance that, you know, the nano patterns are going to be there, but it might be, you know, not particularly durable. Can you rub something on the surface and have the nano pattern survive? And I think the answer is that that's definitely a challenge. There's a lot of interesting ideas about how to tackle that. That's not our first priority right now. Um, and for that reason, you know, we're often looking on surfaces that, you know, aren't going to see a lot of abrasion, for example. But um, we had one company ask us if we could put it on the wheels of rovers. And we were, we were like, mm, that's probably not the best first application for the reasons you're discussing. So definitely a consideration, but um, definitely something we'll be looking into. But it's not our primary consideration at the moment. And so you mentioned roll to roll. I was just wondering, could you dive into that more and how it compares to like what the existing process looks like? So right now, if you're doing nano pattern, it's probably in a wafer fab and you are patterning, you know, a wafer, which might be six inches in diameter, eight inches in diameter. It's a batch process. So you go in, you do a variety of things. Maybe it's an exposure of a resist followed by an etching or something like that. For us, the roll to roll processes, it could be one of many things. The most simple is probably, it's called roll to roll thermal embossing. You take a thermoplastic polymer film, 
you roll your nano patterned metal mold into the surface of that film. Usually you apply heat and pressure. And by doing that, you cause the polymer film to mold to the nano pattern. And then when you remove it, you're left with nano pattern film. You can also use other processes, like one process is called UV nano imprint lithography or UV nil for short. Um, that could be where you have a substrate, you apply polymer precursors to it. You bring it in contact with your mold and apply UV light that causes the curing of that polymer. And then when you remove the polymer from the mold, you are left with nano pattern polymer. And in both cases, whether it's roll to roll thermal embossing or roll to roll UV nil, you have a continuous process where you're continuously rolling a polymer film over this mold and one way or another transferring the mold's nano pattern into the polymer film. Okay, so I guess uh, diving into another application um, of nano coining, it's solar technology, um, something that we've discussed in previous episodes. Um, but what sorts of improvements can nano coining provide for, like solar panels, for example, or, or anything mm -hmm. in in this realm? Yeah, this is a topic I get very excited about because I worked <laughs> in solar for almost a decade. And um, I'm excited that we finally are starting to look at the overlap between nanocoining and solar. Um, but nanocoining and more broadly, just nano patterning can improve solar panels in a variety of ways. And to understand, you just have to understand that the job of a solar panel is to absorb sunlight and convert it into electricity. Any light that's not absorbed can't be converted into electricity. So Nano patterns can increase the amount of light a solar panel absorbs in a variety of ways. And the first is dust, which we just talked about. It turns out that, for example, on Mars and on the moon, dust accumulation has been so bad that it has actually caused some of the rovers to eventually fail because they can't create power from the sun anymore. And on Earth, it's also a problem. In addition to dust, you have pollen and dirt and grime that can build up on the solar panels and block the incoming light. So having dust mitigating surfaces on the surface of a solar panel can solve that problem. And it turns out the same nano features that can add that type of dust mitigating functionality also often make the surfaces super hydrophobic. So on Mars and on the moon, you don't have any rain, but here on earth we do. So when it rains and you have a super hydrophobic surface, the water will beat up and any dust or dirt or grime that has built up can be washed off pretty easily. So it's kind of like a dual purpose. It prevents the dust from building up, but then it also helps any dust that does build up wash away more easily. So dust is a huge thing. But then separately, there's the optical effects of micro and nano patterns. So micro and nano patterns can cause more light to be absorbed by the solar panel. And that might be in the form of an anti-reflective coating or in the form of some coating that helps accept a wider range of angles of light. So not only accepting light that comes in normal incidence to your solar panel, but Maybe at the morning or, you know, in the evening, you have light coming in at a more shallow angle to your solar panel. You want to be able to absorb that light too. And that light is more likely to be reflected. So these type of micro and nano patterns can help accept that light better. And then you've got other optical effects such as diffraction or plasmonic effects. And all those can serve to concentrate light into the solar cell and help the solar cell absorb different wavelengths of light. So a lot of cool ways that nano patterns and ultimately nano coining can improve solar cell efficiency. So I, I have two follow-up questions for that. So my first one is, all these different applications. So one's about dust with the water and one's about reflectiveness. Are the nano coining patterns the same for these applications or would you change it based off your desired application? So you'd focus more on dust on Mars and more on like reflectiveness here or something like that. Right. It, it depends for sure. Now, the materials or the, the type of structures that we would focus on for dust actually 
happen to be very similar to what is known as a moth thigh structure, which is, it gets its name because it, the type of nano features on the structure are the same type of nano features that are found naturally in a moth's eye, and it makes it anti-reflective. So moth eye structures can both make a surface self-cleaning, prevent the buildup of dust, but then at the same time be anti-reflective. So in that sense, it's the same type of pattern. However, um, there are certain patterns where you want bigger features. You want something more on the micro scale. Maybe you want like micro pyramids on the surface or maybe deep inside of your solar panel. And that will help redirect the light so that when it enters your solar panel, it has like a longer path length to travel when it's in the solar panel. So it has more of a chance of being absorbed. So that type of pattern would be very different than the moth eye pattern that might be better at preventing dust buildup or working as a anti-reflective coating. So yeah, in that sense, there might be something that works better for one environment than another, or there might be some pattern that works better for certain light conditions or certain types of solar cells than other. And so my follow-up question, my second question is, if we do have these different patterns that work better in certain applications, then like the next thought is, like a composite material, you take two things that work and you put them together. Uh, has for because it's such nano sized features, has there been much research or much thought into how can we combine different patterns together to create like completely new properties that have both of them together? Yes, that's a great question. And it's true, you could combine multiple patterns. And you could combine where you put the patterns. You might put one pattern on the surface of a solar cell and another pattern embedded inside of the solar cell. And they could you know, both be working in different ways. But I know one thing we've worked a little bit on is what we like to call hierarchical features, which are nano features on top of micro features. And so you can get <laughs> a little bit of both effects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't put a lot of work into it, but we have played around and kind of proven that it's something we can do. And, you know, we actually have an intern working on solar this summer. And if she's successful, we may end up putting her on uh, working on some hierarchical features later in the summer. So my question then is, so you have that background in photonics. I was just wondering how much of that have you been able to utilize in, in this current role? Um, it's definitely been helpful having the background and being able to understand terms like refractive index and understand the difference between a moth eye structure that, you know, is a sub-wavelength structure, meaning that the features are smaller than the wavelength of light, at comparing that to a microstructure where the features are larger than the wavelength of light that we're looking at and understand how those are going to behave differently. And more recently, now that we're actually working on solar, that's definitely been helpful to be able to understand what features might work a little better than other features. That said, when I joined the company, I learned a ton, not only about mechanical engineering, because my two colleagues are mechanical engineers, but also about optics and you know, what, what happens when you make optics extremely small and all the things that can change at that level. And then I guess the follow-up question there is, so you work with mechanical engineers and we've learned time and time and again, the importance of working in an interdisciplinary space. Do you have any advice for MSCs listening to this episode about working with other disciplines that may be entirely different or maybe in a similar field like mechanical or chemical engineering? Right. Well, I definitely recommend doing it first. I guess that's my first big advice is to work with people that aren't material scientists because you're going to learn a lot and you're going to help them learn a lot. And together, you're going to do a lot more than you could individually. But I guess the other thing as advice for material scientists would be try to learn as much as you can about different engineering, different technologies. You know, I've had people I've worked with in the past and they say, oh, I'm a material scientist, I don't do any coding. I'm a material scientist. I don't do any fabrication or any machining or anything like that. If you can do 
those type of things, you can do so much more than if you are just a material scientist who knows space groups or something. <laughs> like you could do so much more if you can walk into a lab and design a new piece of equipment. And you're not going to do that with the pure material science mentality. Again, that's one thing working with mechanical engineers, I've definitely gained some confidence in my mechanical engineering skills over the last couple of years. Moving on to other applications that we've talked about previously that now are coming back full circle. Uh, another uh, group of uh, like materials we talked about before was metamaterials. So uh, from previous conversations, we know that you're working with the army on large scale metamaterials that can manipulate infrared radiation. So what will this allow the army to accomplish just in general? And then what wouldn't you be able to do without this technology? Right. There is there is so much that metamaterials can enable, both for the army and for civilian applications. So metamaterials very broadly are materials that have some type of structure added to them that adds weird functionality. And so that structure might be on the nano scale, the micro scale, but it can even be on the macro scale. And the types of functionalities it can give are properties that aren't in natural bulk materials. So one example is you can have a material that shrinks when it's heated rather than expanding when it's heated, like most materials would do. Or you can have materials with a negative refractive index, which is obviously something you don't normally see. And our project with the Army is on plasmonic metamaterials and making them using relterol processing, so making very large areas. We're working with this company, Microcontinuum, I mentioned, and a group at the University of Delaware. And our focus is on the IR spectrum. Plasmonic metamaterials are kind of a subcategory of metamaterials. They usually have a metallic structure and if those metallic structures are on the micro or nano scale, it can have very interesting interactions with IR invisible light. And just as an example, the project we're working on um, is to show that we can create a strong absorption peak and that we can tune that absorption peak by tuning the dimensions of our metallic structures. This gives a ton of applications, um, some of which are maybe more, I guess none of them are really low tech, but some of them are more understandable and some of them are much more far out. So it can be things like chemical or biosensors, uh, maybe a sensor that detects chemical contamination in the air or biotin sensor that uh, detects disease. Um, we've already talked about solar. So plasmatic metamaterials can help increase absorption of solar cells. A big application is electromagnetic shielding. So maybe you want to shield a IR signal from either escaping or entering a particular, I don't know, building. Things like that where you want to shield radiation. And then also things like advanced camouflage. And this is where it starts to get really far out. Um, we have a partner who starts, I think, every single meeting by asking us when we're going to deliver her invisibility clo cloak. <laughs> um, obviously, that's extremely far out that the answer is not anytime soon. <laughs> but those type of things you can start to at least think about when you start to think about metamaterials and their really crazy interactions with light. That's fascinating. I still remember like episode one of this podcast, we were just really just diving into nanotechnology as a whole. And one of the concepts was metamaterials and like invisibility cloaks, Harry Potter, et cetera, it felt very yeah. sci-fi. But I guess just to, since you've been able to work with them, how far are we away from kind of achieving that, like what what's now considered like science fiction and maybe potentially turning that into a reality? I mean, I think we're pretty far from actually having an invisibility cloak, but you know, it's actually feasible. People have demonstrated things like negative refractive indices. They've demonstrated that on a very small scale and for very particular wavelengths of light, they can redirect light around an object, which essentially makes it invisible. So these things are, are really feasible. It's just, you know, making them broad spectrum, making them work in, you know, a variety of environments and making them large enough to be useful are all huge challenges. But it's definitely, you know, 
possible, which is kind of cool. Yeah. So when we talk about nano coining, it's very small scale to begin with. And so have we seen in past literature or past experiences where you can create a pattern that works on like a two inch squared, but as we scale it up, like, does it start to fall apart? So is there like a theoretical limit or like, as long as there's a, like a constant matrix of the right pattern, it should theoretically work in all directions. Yeah, for most part, it should continue to scale up because honestly, even if you're on the two inch scale, you're probably talking hundreds of billions of features because these features are so small. So whether it's hundreds of billions of features or trillions of features or whatever is next, quadrillions of features, you know, it should continue to work. Interesting. Okay, so um, this is more like um, general, but one of the challenges that you talked about in a previous conversation is explaining technical concepts to non-technical people. And I feel like that probably comes up a lot when you're this startup company um, and a small company in the early stages of your growth. Um, And so when it comes to nanotechnology, like, how do you how do you explain that to a variety of people? And you while still inspiring them, but also like making people kind of buy into your vision. Right. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge because especially for our small team, we're all technical people. Um, When we're at work, we're talking in very technical terms. And then to switch gears and talk to someone who has no idea, they've never heard the word metamaterial and um, try to explain to them why what we do is cool. It's difficult. So one thing I try to explain is just how small the features we make are. And and one common analogy or or comparison, I guess, that I use is I say, well, think of a the width of a human hair is that big or small. And they usually say, oh, that's tiny. And I say, okay, well, I can fit hundreds of features across the width of a human hair. And now I want to cover an entire window or maybe not an entire window, maybe an entire skyscraper with these nano features. And so you start to appreciate how many of these nano features that would take and how much of a feat it is to be able to cover large areas like that with nano features. But then in addition, when you're trying to get buy-in from say an investor or another company, a lot of times they don't even care about that. What they care about is they hand you a solar panel and they say, can you make this better? You know, they don't want the technical nitty gritty. Um, maybe occasionally you'll have a technical person on the phone call and they they, they want to know a little bit, but a lot of the times they just want an improved device. So we spend a lot of time making small scale prototypes so we can demonstrate improvements. Um, sometimes it's sufficient to point to literature and say, look, people have already done this on you know, publish papers, and we can now scale this up. But a lot of times they actually want to hold the the physical prototype. So we do put a lot of effort into making prototypes of a variety of different applications. Interesting. So you operate more on like the show, show, don't tell, or maybe show and tell in this. Yeah, show, (laughs) yeah, maybe show and tell. And if they seem interested in the technical stuff, we'll dive into it. And if it looks like they're glazing over, we we'll just say, hey, look, your solar cell got better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we saw in like a uh, previous episode, Julia Moore. So she like operates like a, a VC um, mm-hmm. firm. And she was basically saying that like they have designated employees that like m- more so uh, like they're, they're more so asking the, que- the technical questions and, and things like that. Um, so I guess that seems to be a constant theme with maybe yeah. all investor teams that, that you're working with. Yeah, that's about right. Well, yeah, like uh, many other concepts within material science and engineering, nano coining can make a wide impact in all these different industries. And I think you've done a great job trying to break it down into all these different things that we've already talked about, which I find very cool as it's like a full circle. So considering everything we discussed today, what advice would you give to any MSCs who want to figure out what industry they want to make an impact in? Yeah, I think um, material science, I don't know, I love material science, but one of the cool things about material science is it's so versatile. You know, you can go into everything from medical devices to art, to construction materials, 
And because of that, you can find something that you're passionate about or something where you feel like you can make a difference and you can find an overlap with materials. I think your podcast name is perfect. It's a material world. Everything's made out of materials. So you can find a good way to overlap a passion you have with material science. And I think a great example is I know a couple episodes back, you guys interviewed someone who is working in fashion. And if you're passionate about fashion, there's ways where you can apply material science to fashion. I know of someone who is passionate about art and used synchrotron x-ray radiation experiments to study the painting behind the painting. And, you know, that, that type of stuff, you can always find an overlap, even if it seems, you know, really out there, there's, there's always something. And for me too, it's important to make a difference with what I do, which was a big part of me, you know, joining our, well, joining a research group that studied solar panels as a PhD student. And, you know, maybe you can find something like that. Maybe your passion is helping people with healthcare. Uh, Maybe you just find something really technically interesting and you want to jump in, but there's a lot of different ways you can find overlap between something you're passionate about and material science. And even if there's not a job out there, you can make a job if you, you know, think about how you can commercialize that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the main goals with the podcast. And I don't think we'll ever really run out of episode ideas or episode topics because there's just so much out there in terms of breadth. And hopefully listeners can pick and choose what they're interested in or listen to each and every episode and be able to figure out what they want to dive into more and learn from because there are so many potential paths out there. So yeah, I, I really loved hearing about this nano coining process. It was an absolute, absolute pleasure speaking with you. And I'm very excited for the growth of smart material solutions. Yeah, thank you. We're excited too. And thanks so much for having us. It was well having me, but you know, <laughs> a lot of the all the other employees at Smart Material Solutions were involved, even our lab dog. Um, we have a lab <laughs> dog. And I'm actually at home right now because I was afraid she would be barking in the background while we recorded. <laughs> I think I saw on LinkedIn, uh, your dog was called like the head of security or something at the company. Yeah, Yeah, we call her our chief security officer. She she does a very good job at it. Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) Cool. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, Believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.